Hello, everyone. Welcome to the very first episode of Austino Sports Talk. I would just like to say I am beyond excited, beyond thrilled, and I am hyped to finally start this podcast of mine. Luckily, I was able to land an amazing guest. He is my friend. I work with him on the Cosumnes River College newspaper. Again, I knew this guy would be my first guest from the get-go. Class of 2019, former Laguna Creek high school baseball player, current Cosumnes River College baseball player, Alejandro Baron. How you doing, man? I'm doing great, man. That's a great introduction. I feel honored to be here. Dude, hey, you're you're a legend, man. Uh, <laughs> hi, so I just wanted to kind of get you on the show. Again, thank you for joining us. And I got a lot of stuff that I... My bad. I got a lot of stuff to ask you, man. Um, I kind of want to start with your baseball journey, of course, going into high school, going into college, kind of just give me your story and then I'll kind of have you elaborate on some stuff and then we'll talk some baseball. You're an A's fan. I'm a Giants fan. And so I know you're a big baseball fan and I am too. So I think that's going to be fun. All right. Um, if you're ready, let's dive right in, dude. Let's do it, man. Cool. So just, you know, being myself, being you, we're both the same age. We're both 19. Uh, I know our parents and our guardians, this whole generation in general kind of had us playing sports at a very young age. It was a way to kind of make friends. We kind of were playing everything before we kind of knew what sport was ours. So I kind of want to ask you as a kid, what were the sports you were playing? Um, how did you kind of fall in love with baseball and kind of take me through your journey up until high school and kind of growing up as a kid, what sports did you play? So growing up, um, I think home, um, like my whole life, I've always been like a one sport guy. I've never really gone into, you know, different sports. Like I've stick to the sports that I've generally just loved at that point in my life. So growing up, I was, so my story doesn't, isn't really like, I think like most you would expect, you know, to me to say like, yeah, I started playing T-ball when I was a really little kid. Like that's not the case for me. When I was little, I was like my first sport that I loved was actually soccer. I really, to this day, I love soccer, but um, I wanted to play baseball since I was a kid though, but it just never ended up working out. So my whole life I was thinking, you know, I'm going to grow up, I'm going to play soccer in college and, and high school, but it, like I still had that like secret, like in the back of my mind, I was like, I, I like baseball. One day, one day I'll try it out. So growing up, uh, the only sport I really played was, was soccer, which is, you know, pretty unusual, you know, for me to say now that I'm in college playing baseball. So right around, you know, like 11 years old, I told my dad, I was like, Hey, like, I, I want to play baseball. Like, uh, since I was little, I wanted to, and I, you know, never, it never came to fruition. So, um, uh, I was like, I want to play baseball and things just from the get go just worked out. I couldn't even, I can't even put into words, like how, how that happened, especially with now I can say like, it's such a tough sport. Like there's, you can't just pick it up. And then for me to pick it up at, at an older age where, you know, most kids at 11, 12, at once they hit that little like peak of like little league, they're like, oh, it isn't for me, I'll stop here. For me to pick it up was, you know, it's weird. It's like, from my perspective, I think that's, that's a little unusual. So picking up baseball like really late, I think is, is a bit unusual for, for my story, but the fact that I can say, you know, like, eight years later, I'm still here doing, doing this at a college level, I think is just, you know, beyond from what I expected. Maybe at first, of course, I'm going to take things seriously. Like that's kind of the um, athletes mentality that I have. Anything I, I do, I'm going to do it at 110%, but I didn't expect me to get this far and to do some of the things that I've been able to do when I picked up the sport really late and I fell in love with it. And I'm thankful to still, you know, be playing the game that I love. That's awesome. That, that's honestly really cool. So like you said, a lot of kids kind of pick up their main sport playing like, oh, I've been shooting the ball since I was four years old or shoot, I was hitting off a tee when I was five. So 
it's really cool that you were kind of able to start that journey. You were kind of a late bloomer. And like you said, you're still able to play, you know, college ball. So that's, it's definitely impressive, but kind of want to touch on that soccer thing real quick. So you said you started playing soccer before baseball. So did you like drop soccer once you realized you wanted to pursue baseball around that like 11 to 12 year range? Did you just kind of drop soccer or did you continue to play soccer a little bit? Yeah, I, I dropped it as soon as as soon as I kind of realized I was like, this is this is what I want to do. So that's why at that like 11, 12 year range when I was still playing soccer a little bit. Um, when when I was first getting into my first travel ball teams, like a little bit and still playing some some little league here and there, um, I was definitely more of a of a base hit steal bases guy. And then eventually, once I got to high school and I found out what a weight room was, yeah, my my game evolved after that. <laughs> you went ham yeah. once you saw that weight room, huh? Yeah, I I definitely went from there's a significant you know uh, change from eighth grade freshman year to to what I am now. So did you watch baseball like when you were a kid, like? How did you get into baseball? You, you said you kind of knew you wanted to play ever since you were a kid. Did you watch baseball? Did you, like, how did you discover baseball as your sport? So since I was a little kid, I remember just baseball being on, on TV. Like, in my household, I could just remember just either it's going to be soccer or it's something sports is going to be on. So it's either, like, soccer or baseball. And to this day, it's like that. So growing up, I can, like, vividly remember the the Phillies winning the World Series, the Yankees winning the World Series in 20, 2008, 2009. But even younger than that, I can remember on ESPN, uh, ESPN Deportes, having the Caribbean Series on where all the Winter League teams from Mexico, the Dominican Republic, from Puerto Rico, all the champions from those leagues playing in the Caribbean Series, that's a huge tournament. And like January, that's going to start up pretty soon here also. Um, I remember that being on TV all the time. And that's when I remember like those series were the first time that I remember asking my dad, like, what's going on here? How does this work? Why are they doing that? And that's how I kind of became, you know, just interested, just kind of, you know, sitting down on the couch and like being like, oh, this is cool. And just watching. And ever since then, I was like, yeah, I want to play, but it just never happened. And then eventually I was like, you know what? Like I, I said I was going to play. Let me play. And you know, eight years later, here we are. So I'm just going to kind of guess because it looks like your dad kind of knew about baseball. You were kind of asking me about it. So who was your inspiration growing up? Whether like, who was your favorite player to watch? And like, was your dad an inspiration because he was able to kind of give you that insight on how baseball was played and kind of on all the technicalities of it? Like, did your dad kind of help you with that? And uh, tell me who your favorite player was growing up. My dad definitely has to do a lot with it, not just from a sports perspective, but in life. Um, I feel like, you know, he's taught me everything that I know to this day, just hard work and dedication. So, um, but from a sports perspective, I mean, he's just as big as a sports nerd, I would say, in my opinion, as I am. So whether it came down to, to soccer or baseball, he's more on the soccer side and I'm the one now who's telling him, you know, what's going on, like, why, what happened on this play, like, why did he do that, you know, stuff like that, but um, growing up, I would definitely say that one of my favorite players, because I would look at players who, who I could identify with, someone that, that looks like me, someone who I can envision being me, one of my favorite players growing up was definitely Adrian Gonzalez, he's a guy that, you know, 40 homers with the Padres almost like for a good few years in a row would was on a couple of good Padres teams growing up. Um, you know, I think his last good run with the Padres was uh, in, in 2010 when the Giants came in last second and stole the division from him. And, you know, obviously we got a great run from the Giants after that and being able to not only briefly see that, that stint of Adrian Gonzalez with the Padres, but, for him to, to go to Boston, which is actually incredible for a player of like that, someone that inspired me, being able to see him go to a big market team was um, incredible. And to see that that 
incredible trade between the Dodgers and the, and the Red Sox that would send Carl Crawford, Adrian Gonzalez, Josh Beckett to the Dodgers and have a couple couple good years down there and really, you know, identifying with the Dodgers fan base down there. So um, Adrian Gonzalez definitely is, is one of my favorite players when I was growing up. It's a pretty interesting choice. You know, obviously, as me as a Giants fan, I actually do kind of disagree with you there. Um, but I'm just kidding, man. Uh, yeah, honestly, Adrian Gonzalez was a hitting machine, dude. I remember yeah. watching him. Like, I started watching baseball right after the Giants won in 2010. I don't like to consider myself a bandwagon because they didn't make the playoffs in 2011 and 2013. But I remember watching him play. And that dude, I mean... I understand he, his batting average is, you know, a little above 300. Obviously, he didn't get a hit like 66% of the time. But every time they needed a hit, it, it seemed like he was the one getting it. So it's a pretty cool inspiration. I, I definitely admire that. Um, so I kind of want to hop into your high school career, man. Uh, we kind of talked about your early stages, how you fell in love with baseball. You know, obviously, you had your inspiration. You had your dad. And I think I can kind of relate with that, too, just because, my dad kind of got me into sports, and I, I think that's kind of the gift a lot of dads can kind of give to their sons is a, a love for sports. So let me hop into that high school career of yours. So first off, you're number 25, right? You're still number 25 now. Yeah. What does 25 mean to you? Did you choose that number, or is that where, where number 25 come from? 25 comes from just – it was my first Little League number, I kind of just stuck with it. I'd like to say, because my dad brought it up one time, I didn't even think about it. I'd like to say it's because when my dad used to watch the A's back in the 80s and early 90s, that it's because of Mark McGuire, but no, it's just the number that I just, it was my first little league number, kind of stuck with it. Um, for the longest time, my number was 52. And as an A's fan, I don't know if you can already assume where that, that number is coming from, but when early 2012, you know, 2012 through 2014, um, Ioannis Cespedes was my absolute favorite player from, from those A's teams. Yes, he was a beast. So the day he got traded to the Red Sox, I was very, very sad that day. But 25 is just my, my first number. And I thought 52 was a really awkward number to have in the infield. Um, I feel like it's an outfielder's number. But, yeah, just switched it back around to 25 by the time I got to high school. That's really cool. That's a good point. You see a lot of lower numbers with, with players in the infield. Yeah. So what, let's see, basically, I, I know you were like a utility player in high school. So did you have like a favorite position in high school? Like what position, like name every position that you played. Jeez, I played in the outfield. I played third. I played first. Maybe at some point I got put up the middle. Um, but I got put up the middle during, uh, earlier stage, like freshman, sophomore year when I was a little bit, you know, a little bit lighter on my feet, <laughs> where I was definitely still stealing bases. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, that was a definitely, definitely, uh, and like evolution from my freshman year to, to senior year, but I'd say primarily just the corner infield and a little bit of outfield. My sophomore year is where I, when I primarily played at the outfield out of, necessity but I'd say corner infield so what was like your least favorite position to play because obviously you know playing in the outfield playing in the infield pitching they're all completely different even every position in the infield you know different angles on the ball everything's different what's like your least favorite position like if you were put at that position did you just have like that thought in the back of your head you're like the outfield the out, anywhere in the outfield <laughs> anywhere in the outfield because in my mind when when I was a sophomore I started the year in in JV which I was a little bit disappointed about if I'm being quite honest and I remember my my coach coming up to me he was like hey we're gonna throw you in the outfield and I was like at first I was like like confused I was like why and he was like well like we need it I don't know like some something along the, that line and then later I found out they threw me in the outfield to see if I can even play there because of you know, varsity needing some, some outfielders. So, but there's a, there's a difference between, you know, JV baseball and varsity baseball. So when I, I got thrown into outfield uh, on a JV team, I was like, okay, whatever. It's catching pop flies. Like it's easy fly balls. There's nothing, you know, out of the ordinary, ordinary there. 
But once you got to, to varsity baseball and you got guys, you know, actually tanking balls over your head and you got to go back on them and you're like, I don't know how to read these. I don't know how to run back. I don't know how to, you know, switch, you know, angles if the ball's moving on me. So, yeah, I'd say the outfield was was a little was a little different and out of the ordinary for me. Yeah, I played baseball for one year in like seventh grade. I played for the city league and I was in the outfield and I, I totally get what you mean. You know, you're in practice and you're running drills and your coach is just kind of like hitting straight, you know, you know, fly balls that are in the air for like 20 seconds and you just kind of stand under it and catch it. And you're like, yeah, this is easy. But when you're in a live game and those balls are getting hit twice the speed of that and they're coming down, you know, off the fence. I mean, like you said, those are just so hard to read, but. Yeah, I definitely, I definitely see where you're getting there. Um, so you, primarily you said you played in the corners, you played at first and third. Are those that, like, if you had to choose, did you kind of fall in love with those positions? Were you kind of forced into playing the corner or like, is that kind of your favorite position to play? I kind of remember also like early on in Little League, that was just kind of the position I was thrown into. I just kind of embraced it the first you know, travel ball teams I was on, I played third and it just ended up working out. Like, um, it's definitely a position that I've, you know, embraced, gotten comfortable with to, you know, now it's like ball to, to my backhand, to my forehand, coming in with the bare hand to, to throw on a swinging bunt, like all those things, like I'm super comfortable with. So, um, those are those are just positions that I was kind of thrown at when I was early on, and I just continued with it. I've never seen an issue with staying there, so they're wanting to go to a different position. But yeah, I'd say that third base and you know first base when when needed to are the positions that I'm growing to be most comfortable with and I'm good at. For sure. So kind of bring me into your high school baseball career think a little deep here what would you say is like your favorite on the field and off the field memory so you know obviously you know you bond with the team this was all before COVID you could probably go hang out with the team do some spontaneous crazy probably some not okay stuff tell me what tell me what the what the life was like being a high school baseball player you know popularity wise like you know where were you in the rankings man what, what were some of those memories some of the memories um, off the field, I'd say um, the way the way you see me now, like, you know, like in class, I'm not the first to talk for, for anything. I'm not going to go out there and say anything. Once I'm most comfortable with my peers, I'm definitely a lot more out there. But when it comes to just the like as a whole, um, I think the only thing that kept me relevant in high school was the fact that I played sports and I think I did it you know well so in terms of like you brought up popularity I wouldn't say I wasn't like popular but I think you know for whenever we had you know any sports related events whether it was like a photo shoot for the school or anything I was kind of especially when I got to to be a senior I was the one kind of the poster boy if you could say um but the fact that I was kind of on the quieter side in my head I was like I better be on this poster. Like I play well enough to be on this poster, but like if it's if it's a popularity contest, I don't think I'm gonna be on that poster. But um, on the field, man, I I would say just real quickly um, before you get into on the field, I kind of wanted to touch on that off the field stuff. Do you have any like fun travel stories like with the team, like go, like on the bus or like just like outside of the like off the field, like just kind of like team bonding? Like, did you do you have any like funny stories? I'm trying to think, man. It was, you know, some memories get lost there in those four years. Oh, yeah. Um, I think one time, man, I don't I don't remember exactly which city, but we're we're in the middle of nowhere. I remember. I remember like getting once we got into like mountain ranges, I was like, and I lost cell signal. I started to think, I was like, where are we even going? Where is this high school at? I remember that. We got there. We, we we got there super late because because we got lost and we had like 30 minutes to warm up, kicked kicked the shit out of the team that we were playing, and then we're going home and it's like really late, and you know like I said we're in the middle of nowhere and when we pull up to the game there's like it's like one of those really like ag in, 
focused schools. So there's like cows right next to the field. And we're like confused, like what, what is going on here? And then we're on our way home and it's pretty late. And our coach is like, all right, guys, we're going to stop at In-N-Out, like get something to eat. And we're like, yeah, we're wrong in and out, dude. Yeah, exactly. So we're like, man, like we had cows next to the field. We're in the middle of nowhere. Like what else is going to happen? And then we get off the bus and I think we, our bus driver in the, in the in and out parking lot ran over a chicken. And when we got, when we got off the bus, we saw just a flock of just a bunch of just chickens. And once, once they saw like a, us, a group of people just get off the bus, they just ran. We're like cows, chickens, like what? <laughs> where are we and i'm trying to remember where we were at but i i'm blanking that's good man that that's awesome that's what i was looking for i was really really i was just looking for that random story dude and yeah. you, you gave me that for sure I, I i've never had any experience like that so that looks like some looks like something that's gonna stick with you for, for the rest of your life to tell anybody yeah. all right uh let's go to the on the field memories uh, whether it's an at bat, a play you made on the defensive end, um, a win, you know, even if you weren't even playing, what, what what was? It can be one, it can be five. Give me some of your favorite on the field memories. I had a couple, man. So uh, definitely, I think I'd start with my my first varsity game. I thought I thought for sure when I was going into my sophomore year, I thought I was, you know, a lock to to being on the varsity team, and it didn't end up happening. So. <clears throat> Right around our spring break tournament, I remember sitting and uh, it was a rainy day. So we had one of our um, assistant coaches was a was a teacher at our school at, at Laguna. And he had us, um, you know, uh, come in because it was a rainy day. So we couldn't get on the field. Then we were preparing for a spring break tournament at uh, uh, Folsom High School. And I we walk in that day, they're going over plays and I'm not. I'm kind of off just thinking about other things because like it, it's a varsity team. Like I'm not on that team. Was this year so, sophomore year? Yeah, my sophomore year. Gotcha. Right. And I'm uh, and I'm thinking about this. I'm like I'm like off daydreaming because I'm like I don't I'm I'm not on the team, so I'm just gonna you know think about other things. Like this doesn't really pertain to me. I'm just here for like attendance, right? And then by the end of the of the meeting, uh, my coach, uh, Coach Mayer, who's now a coach at Sierra College, he was like, um. I'd like for you to, you know, come with us next week to to play with us. And then I was like, shit, I should have been paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, uh, I go out there, man. And in the first game, that's why I was really surprised when when he read the starting lineup that first game. And he was like, left field, Ollie. And I was like, what? I went left field? Right in the start. So you, you were right in the starting lineup? Yeah, in the first game. In the first game. I think I must have been hitting like eighth or ninth which is really weird for me but but I was like oh I'll take it I mean I haven't earned anything yet so and I remember like first inning there's like a line drive like a screaming line drive hit to me the left and um, I have to move like I got a really good first jump because or else that ball's right past me and I have to like I ran probably like a good 40 feet for it but it's like on a line and I and I catch it and the guys are kind of like because all they've seen me play is infield so like oh like okay cool. all right all right and my, my first my first ab i got a single i was like okay i was at, my heart was pounding first ab obviously but the second ab i remember like i it was like a whole out of body experience um i had a double and i think i hit it, i think there was two runners on so i hit a double and i get to second base i don't know what what like takes over me but i just start like screaming i'm looking at the dugout they're all hyped for me because that that was like my first big hit as a as a varsity player, and I remember getting in second base, and I I just lost it. I just started screaming. I started like this one thing. I started just I was happy, man. I was like like two hits in, in my first game. Like I think I think I could keep this up. I think I could stay here because uh, uh, apparently I found out later that that was just gonna be like whoa a one week thing. Like I was gonna go back to JV, but by the time we got back to to league the next week. They were like, come on over. I, I switched fields and, you know, it kicked off a, a good varsity career. I mean, wow. hey, if, if you're going to catch a laser line drive and you're going to get a double in your second at bat driving two runs, for them to demote you, I think would that would be pretty dumb of them. So I'm, I'm glad they carried you on. And so you played varsity ball from that moment on all the way up into your senior year, yeah? 
up until my senior year. That's dope. Is there any other uh, on the field memories that you wanted to touch on? I kind of want to jump into your junior year uh, a- after you kind of finish this topic, but is there any like on the field memories that you want to touch on? We'll, we'll keep it in, in, in my sophomore year. Um, the first ever playoff win in Laguna Creek baseball history. Um, I was fortunate to be a part of a part of that team and running like, you know, jumping up and down with your teammates just wrapped around you was a great feeling. I think I, I lost my voice that day because we were, we were just looking forward to that first, you know, once we got that first win out of the way for in school history, we're like, we're, we're good. Like we've made history. We're going to keep on going and, you know, you know we're going to win it all, which eventually didn't happen. But I mean, it's so great to, to be able to look at, at the positive memories and be like, you know, I was a part of the, the first team that, that won a, a high school playoff game for my high school. So that's a, definitely a good memory. I got some good pictures of just, you know, us jumping up and down in a, in a pile. And, you know, it's, it's good memories to, to think back on. No, that's a great yeah. memory. I, 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 I'm not too familiar with, with the whole high school baseball history, especially because I didn't go to your high school. But that, that sounds incredible to be a part of that. All right, uh, let, let's jump into your junior year. Uh, I, I did a little bit of research on my own, and looks like you batted almost 500 your, your junior year. You had 25 hits and 52 at-bats. I know it's high school ball, but if you're hitting 500 in any league or close to 500, you're pretty damn good. Um, talk about your junior year. W- were you like in your high school prime? Were, was there a different mentality there? Like what what was going on that junior year, man? It looks like uh, it looked like you were playing at a different level. Yeah, so going into my junior year, I had really high expectations, obviously. And some some off the field personal things kind of had me down in the first half of my junior year. So then it was just like it's time to bounce back. Like we, it's time to to you know get redemption. And um, I remember the beginning of my junior year. I thought I was gonna start, didn't work out like that. And I was like, here we go again. Got to work myself in the into the lineup. And uh, it started off with again like our our spring break tournament. Um, that that year we went down to to Fresno. And I remember, I think one of our third basemen had, unfortunately, a good friend of mine had um, one day during practice was, uh, we're working on bump plays and, you know, he came in, you know, kind of missed the ball and the ball was left in the same spot where, where he had missed it. So on the next play, on the next bump play, he comes in running in and the ball is still laying right there. So when he goes to step, with his right foot, he lands on the ball and just completely his ankle just goes. So then I step in and um, I remember it was a game. Oh man, it was, I can't tell you the team cause it's, t- you know, teams down from Fresno, but I remember um, the first time like I start in, in the lineup, I remember like, I had a pretty good game. And, and that game, I remember I got hit by I got hit by a pitch twice in one at bat. I got hit like on my forearm, my back forearm, and the umpire was saying that 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 hit the bat. And I was like, dude. And I was like showing like the red spot on my arm. I was like, dude, it hit me right here. He's like, no, it hit your bat. I was like, all right. And then next pitch, I get hit in the back, and I just just launch my bat. I'm just mad going down to first base. Like I just got hit twice in one at bat, but. You didn't charge the mound? It's immediate ejection, man. I can't do that. Did you that. think about it? Was, did you think about it? No, I just, I'm, I'm a pretty collected guy. Um, like, if if I'm going to, if I'm going to, you know, show you up on the field, it's going to be because of my play. I which love that. ended up happening. So, it's that. like the eighth inning. We're, we're into extras, you know, high school baseball, seven innings. Um it's it's we're in extras and I got a runner on third or something I remember I I was like just drive something into the gap like I was just thinking like put a charge into one I remember I like two hopped the the fence which must have been like 350 360 I hit into the left field um the gap between left and and center and I like as soon as I hit it in my head I was like yep that's the one and I put the the go-ahead run in and we ended up winning that game and then 
the game like night after that I went like I think I went four for four five for five and that boosted that 500 average that you were talking about uh, going from from that tournament in Fresno um that last game in Fresno I went like four for four something like that I went on like a 11 or 12 at bat streak of not getting out I remember I was like we came back to to league here we played like sack high or something I remember and by the end of like a two-week span I was like 13 for 13 or 14 for 14 something like that and yeah. like I was like on fire I felt like nothing could get me out and that that mentality obviously helped and a lot of hard work helped and um having such a high average um a lot of it that contributed to it was um one of my weight my um what am i trying to say uh strength training uh classes that i had um my baseball coach was uh the teacher took over to be a substitute teacher like on a long-term basis and on game days he didn't want us and a couple of the other guys who were in the class to lift and he let us hit during school hours in the cages that we had. So the the time I spent after practice hitting plus the time that I had during school to, to hit um, in the cages helped a lot to, to be able to have such a high average like you mentioned. Yeah, no, that, I mean, I was just kind of looking at your, I mean, obviously it looked like you had a pretty consistent, you know, career you always had a pretty decent batting average but that junior year I was like 481 damn so so you say you went on a 13 for 13 or a 14 for 13 14 for 14 streak in there something like that if if we di if we dive deep into the to the max prep stats we could probably find that that stretch that that I'm talking about it but it, it was something like I went like a week without getting out which That's was insane man Great. And I just want to mention before before you move on, I was terrible on defense that year. I just want to put that out there. I wasn't that great. Hey, it's all good, man. Hey, you, you can't be perfect. That that actually, I, I got another question just kind of on the fly there. So would you rather dominate on offense than dominate on defense? Like, let's say, let's say you were an average on the offensive end and you were just stellar defensively or vice versa, you were – stellar offensively or I you know what I mean uh would you rather be stellar on the defensive or the offensive end? I'd rather be stellar on the defensive side because I'd rather you know you're gonna get out you're gonna get out you're you're gonna be um you're gonna fail seven out of ten times and um I just feel like you have to be consistent on, on defense which is something I've definitely been known throughout my career more for my bat than I've ever been for for my glove but um I, that's why I put so much work into into defense now because it's like I'm you know it's it's gonna getting that that rhythm back for hitting for me is such a natural thing because it's something that I I know my swing I know what gets me going I know you know the flaws that I may have and I know how to fix certain things but on defense it's like such a such an unpredictable thing for me because um like I said, I've never been known really for my glove. It's always, if something's keeping me in the lineup, it's going to be my bat. So um, being able to, you know, put in, you know, take a hundred swings, but, you know, maybe take 150, some 200 ground balls. So on the flip side, like I got to work a little bit harder on the, on the defensive side. So if it were up to me, I'd, I'd rather be, you know, better better on the defensive side because I don't I never want to be a real uh, reliability I never want to be that so it's just that's and I've put in a lot of work on the defensive side because I know that you know my bat is always going to be there for me but I, I got to be good on the other side too I think that's really cool because obviously you you kind of admitted to yourself and others know that you you're more dominant on the offensive end and so that kind of gives you the opportunity to just be like yeah I'm dominant on the offensive end that's that's what I focus on that's my craft but you kind of want to you already know that you're pretty good offensively and so you you've kind of put in the work and you, you'd rather focus more on that defensive aspect on it and actually like improve upon something instead of just you know, being closed minded. And so I, I really like that. It's awesome. Um, I kind of want to hop into that senior year. And more specifically, I know you had a really big injury towards the end of that senior year. And that kind of has kind of set up your your path from there on out. And so tell me that injury story. That's something I don't really know much about. And tell me how that came about and 
correct me if I'm wrong, but it looked like you were player of the game, like the game before you injured yourself. So just kind of re kind of go back and kind of just tell that story a little bit. Um, so there's two injuries actually in, in that senior year. So um, it's like the first week of, of conditioning for, um, for baseball. So this is 2018, the school year, 2018, 2019, this is in 2018 where we're, we're on the field and we're doing, um, I'm pretty sure we're doing 60 yard sprints and we're just taking down the time. And, you know, if someone takes a look at me, they're probably going to think like, Oh, he's not that fast, but you know, I've, I've been able to, to, you know, hold my own when it comes to, to sprints. So, um, I remember we didn't, we didn't really stretch that that much. We just kind of had like a little jog, like usual. I don't know, like the kind of stereotypical, just kind of baseball. Like I don't want to run thing. So um, I remember I was I was doing the sixties and I ran once and I was like, it was a pretty good time. Like I had a pretty good time and I was like, but I think I could beat it. So I went a second time around and I remember, like I think back to this day, I was like, if I never had that that second that second sprint, maybe things could be a little bit different, but. I'm running and I'm like really pushing myself um, for that 60. And I got a really good time. I remember I was like, wow, that was uh, like incredible. But on that last step, when I like went to reach to, to be able to, to, you know, you know, beat that time, like as if someone's like throwing, throwing the first base and I'm about to beat it out. Like I, I stretched like that. When my, when my left foot lands, I just felt a pop in my quad. I was like, what the hell was that? I remember I was hobbling around for a little bit and I ended up just, falling down on the ground and I was like I can't do this like that hurt a lot and I I went to see a doctor and I forgot exactly what I had but I had something wrong with my quad I remember I was actually on crutches for a couple of days to just put not have any pressure on on my leg and um yeah it started from there from there it was like a really bad start because it was like first week into into conditioning so that's like the first or second week of school for us which is august so from there it was like well i gotta work myself back up just like every every other year just different circumstances like trying to get into the lineup it was like from here like in, in my opinion where i was like okay this is my year i'm gonna be in the lineup or i'm like now i don't know if i'm gonna be in the lineup now because of a a physical thing and I remember I would I would be cleared to come back um during the fall and I'd come back and I'd try to run the first base and I just couldn't and I'd get shut down for a couple times and to just sit out and not do anything and you know to this day I don't think it's properly healed because sometimes I'll be doing like leg workouts and I'm I'm like dang that feels a little weird that feels a little off but you know just trying to to continue to strengthen that to this day but um later during the season once um again our our spring break tournament this time we get, we're in we're in reno and it's a day it's a really cold day i remember it was like 20 degrees out and i had, hadn't really done a, a whole lot to, to to begin the game so i was by the time we warmed up before the game started to the fifth or sixth inning i got gotten really cold and uh, it was a close game. I remember I was on second base and there was a ball in dirt. And again, people expect me to be fast, but you know, I took that base like so fast. <laughs> yeah, I'm saying bro. And I go to slide in and when I slide in, I guess because of how cold like my muscles were, as soon as I like slid and I went to pop up, I felt a pop in my hamstring and I, I I can say it's because of how cold it was and how cold my muscles were by that point. Like when, when I went to, to slide, it, was, it just gave out on me. I remember I couldn't even stand. I just fell when, as soon as I popped up from my slide, I remember I just fell back down and I, I couldn't really move. I remember like it was a, a really bad pain and I couldn't walk for, for like a couple of days. And you know, all that stuff just really just messed me up from, from that point. And just briefly to go over what you mentioned in, in my last game, I remember our playoff game, we, we, we were down and I remember I hit a ground ball and, and I like ran really hard because I was like, I, I need to beat this out. And when I went again, when I went to stretch, I just felt that pop again in, in my, in my hamstring. I was like, dang, like 
that sucks. And I remember falling down again. I was like, here we go again. Like, I can't believe I did this in my last high school game. And um, those, those are injuries that, you know, uh, affect me or affected me to, to like going into college. So it was, it was wild to, to be able to go through that. But um, I guess it, it, it tells me to take a little bit more care for, for my body. Now I feel like I have to stretch a little bit more often than, than most um, take a little bit longer, take longer jogs, stretch more, you know, more than most people do at, you know, 19, when you think you're, you're still a little, you know, you're still fresh, you're still young, but I feel like I got the legs of like a 28 year old, 29 year old kind of getting there playing 162 games. That's how I feel my legs are, but I'm taking good care of them. That's awesome. Yeah. I know the, the first, the, the, the soul, the one year I played baseball, I injured myself pretty badly. And uh, similar to you, I have to kind of rehab it to this day. I, I was sliding into second base and I slid feet first and I smashed my ankle onto the base and I just shattered my ankle and I had a walking boot and I have this thing in my heel called Seaver's disease. So if I basically, if I'm active for a long period of time, it's like I'm getting stabbed in my heel. So I had to go to physical therapy for that. And to touch on that, you learn a lot about your body when you're rehabbing an injury. Your, our body is like a machine, like just simple, like shoulder rolls. If you do that, like five minutes a day, it's like your shoulder can get better. Don't take that advice. That probably doesn't work, but it's like <laughs> these little movements you do with your body. And that's why a lot of athletes just don't really like physical therapy because they want to, they want to run 10 miles, you know, they want to lift, they want to. They want to lift weights. They want to do the hard grindy work. But when you're rehabbing a body, you're just, if you're, you know, your wrist is sore, you're just, you're just circling your wrist. You're just doing these little simple things. And so I think it's a, when you have an injury like that as an athlete, I think it's a good way to kind of learn about your body and it helps you for the future. You know, we're only 19, you know, you know, average age span, we're, we're going to live till 80, you know, you're, you're fourth away through your life technically. I think yeah. it's a lesson learned, dude. I saw real quick. I saw a kid the other day when I, I went out and I was hitting at, at a park here um, close by and I, I was hitting and I see a kid pull up with his dad and I see his dad pull out like a measuring tape and they, I guess they did a 60 and I saw him like he got there. No, no stretching, no like warm up run, just went straight into sprints and I'm looking at him and I'm like, I remember those days. <laughs> yeah. and just just playing, just running. I'm like, wow, I can't do that now. And yeah. How old was that kid? Probably 13, 14, probably. Okay. All you can yeah. do is hope. You just got to hope he's yeah. lucky and that he never has to stretch. But, you know, once, once that one day comes where, where, where he needed to stretch, you know, he'll probably learn the same lesson you did and that a lot of exactly. athletes learn. Um, so I know your high school career is, is a lot more in depth compared to your collegiate career, just because, you know, a combination of injuries and stuff, you know, your, your collegiate experience has kind of been limited with COVID and all of that. Um, but just real quickly, what kind of vibes were you getting transitioning into college ball? You know, I know CRC is like what a 10 minute drive from, from your high school. So did it feel a lot different? Did it feel the same? How did, how did that, how was that experience? And, like, were, were you nervous going into college? Tell me about that transition. Um, there's there's a whole another story on top of, of just CRC. I was I was actually supposed to go to another college that didn't end up working out, which is another just life lesson within within itself. You know, things aren't gonna you know turn out the way the way you think they are. So um, uh, I was supposed to go to college in the, in the Bay Area. It's a pretty good college. I don't remember just with like not playing summer baseball because of my leg and other things being a factor in it. It didn't work out. So I remember I, I knew I had an option with, with CRC just because um, one of the coaches, the assistant coaches there that um, I've known ever since I started playing a travel ball um, since I was like 11, 12, um, Alex Smith from, from Best Speed Baseball. He's a, he's a coach at CRC and his practices are run at the same kind of tempo and, and intensity that coach Miko does. And I've actually known Miko for a couple of years. Um, so I wasn't nervous at all for, for like practices or anything. Cause it's been the same game, you know, 
it's it's ultimately always the same game you've been playing you know your whole life so but i knew just kind of from what i've seen from from coach miko leading from being in high school leading up to to college i knew i had a couple of you know thoughts about him i thought um most of the time when i'd see him run practices i'd see him screaming at people so i always kind of had that that thought in my head that you know i'm gonna I'm I'm gonna bobble a ground ball and this guy's gonna scream scream his head off at me, but it's not the case. Um, Nico's been really great for me, and uh, I think he's one of the better coaches I've ever had, and that's just with fall practices that, that I've had. He's he's a great coach, so many so much experience in the, in the game, and he's been around some some great baseball minds uh, that he's been able to mention over you know his 30, 40 years of, of being in the game. And um, I think it's everything that I thought it was going to be going into college. Um, his practices are intense at a high level. He expects, you know, um, everything from you. And uh, I don't, I don't think it's anything any different from from what I envisioned or any other practices that I've ever had in the past. So um, I think that that there's definitely a transition between high school and college, but as far as, you know, playing baseball at a high level, it's everything that I thought it was going to be. Nice. Um, so I have a couple more kind of athlete slash baseball related questions, and then I kind of want to hop into some of your non-baseball stuff. But just to kind of touch on, on your experience at the collegiate level, I know you've never been able to actually get into a game because of a combination of things. Um, what would you say is kind of your your best lesson you've learned or what what's your biggest takeaway from from your whole collegiate experience whether it's a memory or a lesson that you've learned um quite frankly based off experiences of being on different teams through um youth baseball high school baseball travel ball that being on the bench is something that i've never been used to and i'm not going to get used to so that summer after after COVID hit and everything was shut down, um, the whole summer of 2020, I spent, you know, just grinding every day. I, I think if I, it's just, I can count on, on um, one hand the amount of days that I took off because it's just like that drive of just being, not being able to play, it, you know, it gets it gets to you. Being being an everyday player to all of a sudden having to never see an inning of play, you know, affects you. And so I I spent the whole summer and you know the whole fall getting into shape. And I think if if we were able to to go straight into baseball um, as soon as the the fall 2020 semester started, I think that would have helped tremendously for me to be ready for the spring because that whole summer I dedicated to just being baseball every single day. I hit every single day. I took a million ground balls every day. And I think that just from the little things that I've been able to take from my collegiate experience so far, despite COVID is that, you know, you might fall, you might fall down, but you got to get it right back up. You got to put in that extra work, like that, failure you know especially over over time not just collegiate ball but you learn that in a game of failure like it just got that failure has to drive you you can't you can't just dwell on failure and just sit and pout about it you gotta you know come right back and and be successful the next time around so that's what I'm looking forward to like I really want redemption this year for not being able to play at all last year like I'm I'm ready I'm ready for this year Heck yeah, dude. So obviously no one likes COVID. I don't want to spend too much time talking about COVID. I have one COVID related question though. Um, so obviously if every single person on this planet that lives a somewhat normal life or a variation of, of a life that is normal, COVID sucks. Uh, you know, COVID is, is awful and, it, you know, it's, it's taken lives away and, you know, it, it's really affected people's futures and people's, you know, present. And so I just kind of want to ask you, has COVID-19 kind of changed your perspective of being an athlete? Has it, I, you kind of touched on it a few minutes ago, I think, but like, has 
not being able to play, not being able to be with the team, having baseball kind of stripped from you, has that made you kind of lose hope with baseball or has that actually pushed you even more to pursue baseball and to get better at baseball? Um, I think you kind of touched on it earlier, but if you want to kind of elaborate on that, how COVID has kind of um, impacted you as an athlete. Yeah, um, there's definitely been those moments where I've, I've lost hope. It's always it's always a constant battle between being fired up for for potentially having a season and also, you know, potential heartbreak if if there is no season. Um, I think it's just the thing of I've sat there thinking about you know like what if there is no season? Like what if I'll sit there and I'll just do hypothetical situations where. But even throughout those situations, like by the end of those thoughts, I end up like, okay, maybe there is no season, but like, what if there is, you got to be ready. You can't just sit on, on the couch, just watching TV or something like it, like if tomorrow we're told we can get on the field, like you have to be ready. So it's definitely that thing between like, yeah, there's more to life besides baseball. And then there's that thought of, but you know, you've put so much time, you've put so much effort into it. Like you care about it. It's not like, it's not like I don't care. Like I, I really want to continue to play baseball and see where this can take me. But there's, there's just that, that tug between you're like, uh, should I, what should I do? What What's going to happen? If there's no season, what am I going to do? But I just, COVID, you know, really took away that, that everyday camaraderie of, of teammates. There's nothing like going to the field or and seeing your teammates and being in the clubhouse and just, you know, playing music, joking around, hopping on that bus for that bus ride. You're playing games, you're you're talking, you're listening to music, you're at the hotel and you're playing the show on, on the PS4 with, with your boys and um, pulling pranks on, on your teammates at, <laughs> and, you know, it's 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 gonna be good if if we could have a season. We're finally gonna be able to get that that banter back between between teammates that that I miss. I miss seeing my teammates. Um, but you know, like I I gotta stay ready no matter what happens with with COVID or not. Like I I gotta keep that mental note that there is going to be a season to keep that drive going of of wanting to play this year. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, that that definitely answers the question. It sounds like even with COVID, you know, you, you have that athletic mindset where you know th there's no off day really. You know, obviously there is stuff outside of baseball, but you know, you just kind of grind every day. You got to be ready. Like if you get the call tomorrow, if if you go back in a month, if you go back in two months, you, you want to be ready. And if anything, you want to be more ready than than the other people that go there because you know you want to impress yourself and, and the coaches. You know, so. Love that mindset. Um, I want to spend like five to 10 more minutes talking about you a little bit and some of your non-baseball stuff. And then we're going to hop into some baseball talk. Um, obviously, I, I know you from the student newspaper, uh, the connection at some sort of college. You were the news editor last semester. You've been on the staff. This is now your third semester, I believe. Yeah. My third semester, too. And uh, I'm the sports editor, and that's kind of how we've been able to bond through through that love for sports. How has the the connection been for you? Has it been able to like fill that void of, of missing out on baseball? Obviously, there's um, like you said, there's other things to life, and you've kind of taken up journalism, not just sports journalism. You've written a lot of feature stuff and news stuff, and ha have you been able to kind of discover a new passion through through journalism? How's that experience been? It's been great, man. Like um, writing has always, you know, just been interesting for me. It, it really started like my senior year where um, I had a teacher who inspired me to, who found a connection for me to to write for the Oak Grove Citizen. And I was writing about football games at, and volleyball games and basketball games. So I knew that, you know, writing, writing and writing about sports was going to be pretty interesting for me. So that's why I really wanted to take it up. So the connection has been everything I've kind of, you know, thought about ever since those first, those early moments of like journalism, like really learning, becoming a better writer every day, reporting, reporting things that, you know, people want to know, people want to, um, you know, read about. It's been, uh, it's been everything that 
I, I've wanted it to be uh, for me. I think it's it's been a, a great thing that to have that, then not only to to be able to learn, you know, from a journalistic standpoint, but to be able to also learn from from my peers, you know, you and Chris and everybody on staff. It's been really great to to hear, you know, different perspectives on different um, news matters, things going around on on campus, and it's been, you know, it's been. It's been great and it's been able to, to help me through COVID. Yeah, for sure. I can probably say all the same for myself. And, you know, I think it's really cool for you because you're able to kind of get every angle of, of, of sports. You know, you're, you're an actual athlete. You're playing sports. You're researching about sports. You're writing about sports. You're, you're able to kind of report about sports. And, you know, obviously you, you've done a lot of reporting outside of sports and written some feature stuff too. So, I think it's a really good thing for you and I, I, I love it too. So I just kind of wanted to get your, your take on that a little bit. Kind of want to end it off with uh, some other hobbies that you've kind of had outside of baseball recently or just that you've always had. I know you have your shoe collection. I kind of want you to show me a couple of pairs and uh, describe those because I know they're right next to you. But yeah. uh, is, there, is there any other hobbies but before we get to the shoes? Uh, any other quick hobbies that you can think of that you you've picked up outside of baseball? Hobbies, sheesh, man. Um, I spend most of my time just just working out, man. I don't know. Um, I think um, getting a getting a job, I guess, it is it isn't a hobby, but the people at my work have been pretty great, and I've really been able to find a good group of friends that I'm grateful for. Um, and because of that, I got back into playing video games a little bit, which is um been fun but a little a little bad on the same on the same uh, at the same time because i stay up a little bit past than i probably should because i'm a really deep sleeper and then i'll stay up late and then i won't get up early to work out so i guess that's a that's a downside but i don't know man hobbies i just even even just like watching netflix or watching disney plus i'm really bad at that like i'll i'll be like oh that looks interesting i'll put it on my list and i'll never watch it like i'm really bad when it comes to watching shows um because i could sit down and watch sports highlights all day like i know it's like kind of moving away from sports but like that's just yeah. kind of what revolves around me i'm really just i i strive to kind of learn something new every day so like I'll watch a baseball game from 1972, you know, like some random, just weird, just facts. I'll watch a game from the 1932 World Cup. Like, it's just weird things like that, that I'll just, you know, I will, not only do do I enjoy just writing from a journalistic standpoint about, about sports, but it's like, I, I love sports to where like, I watch it every day. That sort of, I have no use for cable television if it weren't for sports. Uh Dude, I, I, my grandma and my brother honestly been talking about, you know, here and there, there's chatter that, oh, we're just going to strip Xfinity and we're going to, you know, get this streaming device and just have like Netflix and Hulu. And I'm like, no, we need the sports. We need like, sports, man. You need the sports. You can't, you can't have television without sports. And I, I love that. Um, I think that's kind of the mindset a lot of productive people have, though, is you always want to watch something like I go on Netflix and sometimes I just throw something random on, but like, there's always stuff that looks really good. There's a million things to watch, but you usually only get to watch none of them or maybe one of them. Cause you're just so productive. Cause Hey, I know from firsthand experience, if you get into a Netflix loop or a Hulu loop and you find a show you like, you're going to waste so many hours of your life. Same with video sure. games, but for me, it's more Netflix. I can just watch dumb stuff on Netflix for a whole day and do absolutely nothing. So uh, I like your mindset there. I should probably start uh, giving myself that feeling of, oh, I'm going to watch it. And then I just don't watch it. So I should it's talk, unfortunate, I should man. Though. There's so many, I'm so bad. I'm like so bad when it comes to classic movies. There's so many classic movies I've never seen. And sometimes I'll see them pop up on Netflix. I'm like, oh, it's finally on Netflix. I'm finally going to watch it. No, nope. never, never end up watching it. All right. Uh, I want you to show me a couple pair of your favorite shoes, man. All if, right, if for sure. You want to grab a to, couple off that shelf. I'm going to have to stand up for a quick second. If you, no, you go for it. I got one over here, actually, because I was admiring it earlier. So, as you know, today, oh, one, God, year, one year collection. anniversary of Kobe's death. So, I got the Reebok questions right here. Allen Iverson's um, 
shoe, but a colorway made for Kobe Bryant. So I got these that, that I got that are pretty special. And especially, you know, today, one year anniversary of, of Kobe Bryant's death and not only him, but his daughter and everybody else on the helicopter, which was very tragic. But these are for sure gonna be for a long time, some of my favorites, just because, you know, that factor that Kobe wore these and, you know, Mamba mentality, you know, he's an inspiration to all athletes everywhere on the court and off the court. So these, these for sure are going to be in my collection for a long time. Yeah, dude, yeah, that, yeah. that whole Kobe thing is, it's been a whole year. It just, time flies, man. Time flies. I mean, it feels, it like, feels like he's still here. It feels like he, it's just, I mean, for me as a sportsman, that was probably the most shocking news I've ever seen. You know, you always hear stuff in the news that happens. It's like, oh, A, B, and C is happening today, but there's just nothing that compares to that. I was in, that was insane, but yeah. Uh, back to the shoes. Uh, yeah, you got another pair there? Yeah, I got another pair right here. All right. So here we got another another basketball goat. Here we go. Jordan 1 Mocha's. That's the right goat, by the way. Yeah. Good these, answer. This, these are beautiful, man. I don't even know where to begin. These are beautiful. Um, I'd like to say that that my first pair of ones were going to be an OG, you know, uh, a colorway that Jordan wore on the court. But these these are beautiful either way. These are just, I don't even know where to begin, man. Like when, I don't know if you know, it's like such a struggle to go on the Nike sneakers app and be able to land a drop. And to be able to, to land a, a W on my first try was awesome. So like, I remember you, you talked about this during one of our newspaper classes. You don't wear these shoes, like really at all. Just right now, because I mean, I don't go anywhere, but you know, eventually I'm, I'm gonna end up wearing these and I'm gonna wear them quite often. But I mean, I just don't see myself going to, to the grocery store real quick for some milk, wearing some some ones, you know. Mm. That's just my thing. And I either if I leave the house to to either get groceries, work out, or go to work. So it's kind of tough to be able to, you know, wear these to to like the right occasion. So it, it's more yeah. of like a collection thing for you. Like, you know, you're gonna wear them eventually, but you, you just want like that collection. Yeah, I've always kind of dreamed about having these these sneakers. I've always like I can run back to like middle school thinking like, wow, those are cool. I really want them. And not just that on the flip side, knowing, you know, just sports and knowing what Michael Jordan means to to basketball, to pop culture. It's just like you it's it's kind of cool. Like having having a pair of Jordans on your feet is like a definitely another like a good feeling, especially when someone like acknowledges like, oh, those are dope. Like that's a good feeling. That's the thing for me, man. I know if I had those shoes, I would be everywhere with those shoes. If I walked outside, I'd have a pair. Of, I admire that. I, I like how you don't you don't necessarily need to show off your your collection everywhere you go. But uh, would you ever sell any of these shoes or no? I mean, eventually, I think if another if a better shoe comes along, or if there's a shoe that I don't necessarily need. I think I would let some go, but at the moment, the ones that I have right now, just because, you know, this is kind of the first time I'm kind of, um, I've always wanted to get into, into shoes, but never had the money for it. Now that I have a job and I can kind of take care of myself in, in that sense, um, I think down the line, once there's a bigger collection and I can, you know, kind of sell them, maybe trade for, for another, another shoe, I think eventually, but, you know, the foundation pieces I have right here, I'm going to hold on to these, especially because of the first few pairs. I'm going to hold on to them. Pretty awesome. All right. I want to ask you one more question about yourself, and then we're going to hop into some baseball. For you sure. can be a little brief here just because we have used, I think, almost an hour and 15 minutes, man. You have a lot to tell, and I absolutely love everything you're telling us. Uh, what is your future plan with, with baseball, with life? I, I know, I think you said you were transferring next semester, or you're, you're going to transfer soon. What what's the short term future like for you? See, even I don't know. That's a that's a COVID um, another COVID situation. It's like I gotta hold on to see if we have a season, then just see where that takes me. 
you know, hopefully have a good year and and be able to to go somewhere and do something with that. But if not, man, I'm I'm thinking I'm going to have to just focus on education, but I hope not. Like, I really I really want to see I don't want to move on. And, you know, 10 years from now, I'll be like, wow, what if, you know, that's, a, that's I feel like that's the worst thing you could do. Like, think back and be like, things could have been different. So I want to be able to at least get on the field to at least show something and be able to, you know, maybe have an opportunity to, to do something at a different school. But I mean, I'm not the only one facing this issue. There's four-year universities who are having a backlog on, on just a bunch of players who are having to stay at their, at their college and not being able to move on to, to, you know, pro ball, like a lot of us, you know, it doesn't help that the MLB draft is having like, you know, five rounds, 10 rounds. It doesn't, it doesn't help in that sense, but I don't know, man. It's a, we're going to have to wait and see. It's kind of in the air. For sure. All right. So I just want to thank you for telling us your, your whole life story with baseball and a little bit of non-baseball stuff. I think a lot of listeners and athletes that listen to this are going to be able to have a fun time listening. They're going to be able to relate to some of your stories and some of your lessons and experiences that you've kind of caught on the way. And again, just, just thank you for sharing. If some of that was personal, then again, thank you. Thank you for sharing it with, with the public audience and uh, let's dive into some baseball. For sure, man. So I think this is kind of fun because we are journalists and the whole Michael Brantley thing was very interesting. <laughs> I got the notification saying he was going to go to the Blue Jays with George Springer and, you know, that was going to be a thing. And then uh, it was Hazel May who actually reported it first and then Ken Rosenthal like confirmed it and you know Ken Rosenthal he, he's like the, the woge of basketball like he reports basically everything baseball related and then a few hours later <laughs> the Blue Jays are like hold up hold up he, he, he this we're just kind of interested we didn't sign him yet and then he ended up going back with the Astros and I think my quick thoughts on it is as a journalist I really understand what Hazel May was doing because if you think about it, it's like if you're an incoming sports journalist, you want to make an impression. You want to be the first to break something because if you're the first to break news like that, you're going to get a lot of clout. You're going to get a lot of credibility and you're going to gain a lot of popularity. So I think for Hazel May, or I'm not in her shoes, but if, if I was in her shoes, it's like, all right. I'm 95% sure that Michael Brantley is going to the Blue Jays. So I'm going to report this and I'm going to be the first to break it. And then obviously there's that 5% chance and it just didn't happen. And uh, I, I don't, I don't think she lost her job. I, I looked it up. I think she, you know, she's fine, but that's, that's just interesting, man. Like, I don't think, I don't know what I would have done, but I think that's something you have to think about being a journalist in, in any field is you got to know it for sure. Like if you report something like that, that that's a lot of pressure. If it's wrong, you're going to get a lot of backlash for it. Yeah. And it's not the, the first time that something like this has happened. There's, I don't know if you've been following just a bunch of different reporters who, you know, are supposed to be pretty credible. I know you mentioned um, Ken Rosenthal. Once, once you see Ken Rosenthal, you know, tweet something out, you're like, okay, it's hundred percent. Like mm -hmm. it's, it's done. Like I've been able to see a couple of different, um, journalists tweet out things like I, I remember saying something about like Trevor Bauer wants 200 million dollars something about that and then Trevor Bauer like tweeting under it is like that's not even true I didn't even say that something like that it's like it's calling these journalists out who who are saying things that maybe they're making up maybe not be true and in and, and this case you're like well I'm sure he's gonna go to the Blue Jays let me let me put that out there and take the 5% chance that, you know, it's going to be wrong. And unfortunately it didn't end up happening, which is, which is pretty crazy. Like you think in my, in my head, I was already kind of imagining, I was like, okay, like Bichette, Biggio, Guerrero, Brantley, Springer. And then all of a sudden you're like, he's an Astro again. Like what just happened? Like how, what happens in, in the span of like five hours of being a Blue Jay to now being an Astro again? Yeah, I mean, I, I think Michael Brantley, obviously, when he was he was such a good player in his prime, like he, he was underrated. Like he, he was bad in like 330. He, he was a, he's still a really good player. And so I, I think him going back to Houston is a decent fit for him. It looks like that's where he wants to be. 
Um, but just to kind of transition into the Blue Jays, uh, you know, George Springer got that massive deal, six year, 150 mil. He's like 31 years old. So they have him locked up for the rest of his prime. And so Blue Jays are scary. That, that lineup, uh, they got a lot of talent. They got a lot of names. They get on base. They got a lot of pop. Like, I'm not quite sure how their pitching is going to do, but that that offensive lineups, they're going to create some runs, man. And they're going to be a fun team to watch with Vladimir and Biggio and Bichette and Springer. And that, that lineup's going to be pretty deadly. And, you know, I think those Blue Jays Yankee series and the, those, uh, those division series are going to get intense with the Red Sox and, uh, I'm looking forward to it. What, what are your thoughts on the Blue Jays? The key, the key thing here is a lot of young talent. Exactly. And to add on Springer, who has, you know, two World Series appearances under his belt, going to bring in an experience and lock down center field and be able to just free roam out in that outfield and, you know, run down uh, fly balls and, and re- really be able to, to spark um, what I anticipate him from the leadoff spot because – from the leadoff spot and what you've been able to see Springer is not afraid to to turn on a OO fastball first pitch of the game and just you know launch it for a home run it's going to be a really a, a game changer for for the Blue Jays to be able to have that spark to be your leadoff spot be able to to start with with such an offensive threat like like Springer and on the flip side be able to get such a good center fielder who who can track down everything out there and not only have that spark from the leadoff spot, but to trickle down into uh, a now less than lost 50 pounds, Vladimir Guerrero Jr., who looks incredible after this offseason, and Biggio and, and Bichette, who have really promising futures. Yeah, that top of the lineup is going to be crazy because, like you said, Springer's most likely going to be batting leadoff. And then after that, I, Biggio, I, I would imagine, would be second in that lineup. And those are two players who have great on-base percentages, and they're going to get on base, and they're going to set up Bichette and Guerrero. And so uh, they're going to be a fun offense to watch. They were fun last year, like you said, with the addition of Springer. That's just going to make that lineup even more more deadly and dangerous. So I don't know. I I, I think they're I think Canada's in a good spot when it comes to baseball right now. It'll be fun to see what they do. Uh, and if we get that that same playoff format this year, which I don't know, I don't know what's going to happen, but they're, they're a lock for the playoffs. Oh, yeah. All right. Uh, probably, I would say probably one of the biggest, if not the biggest, like offseason moves that have happened is we got Francisco Lindor on the Mets. Um, that is really interesting, especially because they just signed him to attribution. They didn't even extend him. And so it'll be interesting if the Mets actually hold on to Lindor for the rest of his prime and the rest of, you know, four or five years. But I think Lindor is huge because kind of like the Blue Jays, that Mets lineup, dude, (laughs) they, they got Pete Alonso, they got Michael Conforto, they have James McCann, like James McCann is a great pickup. Yes. The White Sox, that, that guy is to get a good catcher in, in any lineup, especially a, a good young catcher, is that, that's that's going to be huge. But uh, I think, you know, with, with Robbie Cano, unfortunately, get getting that that boot for a year, uh, I, I think Lindor is going to be able to go in and kind of – he's going to, I think, be more productive than Cano would be right now. But I think that's, that's huge. I, I think the Met, they got a good starting rotation. And the, the Mets, you know, obviously they had that – World Series appearance back in 15, but I think the Mets are going to be in the conversation for, for a playoff spot, and I think they're going to be pretty good contenders. Yeah, definitely. Um, Steve Cohen, ever since purchasing the Mets, has been such a, a better, you know, management than the Wilpons. The Wilpons really just, you know, killed the Mets over the amount of years that they've they've been able to hold on to the Mets you know being in in New York such a big market you'd expect a team to be always contending but you know the Mets have always kind of been like a living meme over over there like uh just the amount of years they've been in the in, in the league and you know Francisco Lindor getting getting 30 home runs and a 300 average from the from your leadoff spot and and now coming to, to the bright lights of New York where, you know, his personality is there. He has the personality and charisma to live up to everything in, in New York. And 
not only that, but I mean, I've heard stories from like Trevor Bauer, like he, he he's a leader. Like as soon as he came in from, from the minor leagues, like he had that, that play to back him up and, and that charisma to, to step into that in that locker room and just be a, a leader from the get go. And being such an important position, like a shortstop position where you're getting a platinum Glover coming over from, from Cleveland, like he's, he's a definitely a game changer for them. And, you know, he's going to spark again, mm-hmm. he's going to spark that offense again, anticipating from the lead off spot to trickle down to Conforto Alonzo. It's, it's going to be fun to, to watch him and play. And I anticipate before the season even started, I anticipate him getting a, a good extension for the, the most to get, ultimately like the last years of his career I think he's gonna be in New York for for a long time yeah you bring up a good point because obviously you know Cleveland as as a sports city does not get nearly the the attention and the clout that New York gets and I think with Lindor he obviously has the talent and he's already like top 10 top 20 player in the league if he goes to New York and he puts up really good numbers and he's leading that Mets team to, to like a playoff berth, he's going to get a lot of recognition. And I, I think with him in the spotlight, like you said, he's got a juicy personality, man. He, he He's fun to watch some of his interviews and the way he's he has fun in the game. Uh, hey, he, he's kind of like Anderson from, from the White Sox, man. They both kind of have just like, they, they have fun with the game, you know? And so I, I think it's going to, I think it'll be a good fit for him. I hope he stays. Um I hope so too, and I hope I hope they bring back those black jerseys. Those black jerseys are, are dangerous. The 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 black and blue ones with the yeah, those are drippy, man. Those are drippy, man. I hope I love drippy uniforms. Dude, like if you're gonna like, I, what I don't understand is like if you're gonna have one drippy uniform like one day out of the week, why would you not wear it all the time or have multiple drip? Like why have like this basic white uniform like ninety percent of the time and then only drip out like once a week? You know. I don't know. I love I love the tweet from from Cohen after signing Lindor or getting Lindor from the from Cleveland. He's like, "All right, we got that out of the way. Now the important things. We know we need those black jerseys." I, <laughs> I saw that on Twitter after he got Lindor, and I was like, "I hope I hope they bring those back. Those are those remind me of Jose Reyes and, and David Wright." And I feel like we're gonna get another golden golden age of of New York Mets baseball with Lindor and Alonzo and Comporto. So I think I think they need to bring those back. So. You know, you look good, you feel good, so I and you play good, so hopefully. All right, uh, let, let's touch on uh, some breaking news that happened like an hour before we started recording. Uh, JT Romuto re-signed with the Phillies, five years, 115 mil. That is a huge signing for Philly. Again, another big market there, and honestly probably the best catcher in the league right now if, if you're if you're looking at it from you know obviously i'm a huge giants fan i love buster posey but you know he's out of his prime and jt Romuto, he that is going to be huge for philly and i think that's going to be ultimately like the backbone that glues them together if he's able to keep producing like he's been i think that's huge it'll, it'll be interesting to see you know how philadelphia is able to actually kind of keep up with with the mets and the nationals and the other team in the national league but I don't know that they got a lot of big names, but it, it just kind of depends if they're actually going to, you know, turn it around and turn that into wins. But I think that's a big re-signing for Philadelphia. And I think they're, that fan base has got to be happy right now. And you bring up Posey. Um, Bruno is only making yearly a million more dollars than Posey. I understand Posey got that, that extension back in 2012, 2013 when, when he was Buster Posey. But I think, I think JT deserved a little bit more cash, in my opinion, because he's the best catcher in the game. But well, you see, I think the difference here is Buster Posey, when he got that contract, was better than Ramuto is now, and so Posey does deserve that cash money. And so, hey, that's true. That's, that, true. that's interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. But hey, I'm I'm glad Buster Posey is still making more than him because he's the, he he is the goat of of the Giants. Man. The Giants baseball man. Yeah. Oh, man. Um. I, it's a great signing. He deserves it. JT deserves it. He's the best catcher in the league. Definitely. But I think the downside is, is I don't, I don't think the, I mean, he was on the team last year. Like the Phillies are getting a solid foundation piece that they need because JT is the best catcher in the game, but I don't, they, they need, they need something else. They, 
they can't sit around wasting JT and Rice Harper's prime for not having enough good pieces around them. Like the Phillies really need to pick it up in in order to to be able to to make it to the playoffs, to be able to to put in you know put to use those good JT and Harper signings and and be able to um, you know make it just be able to find success after you know, what's going to be like 11, 12 years since uh, they last made it to a World Series. Yeah. Uh, so, obviously, I kind of want to dive into our teams a little bit. Uh, you know, obviously, we I don't hate the A's as, as a Giants fan. You know, I I despise the Dodgers. The A's are – they're there. And I, honestly, I, if I'm not rooting for the Giants, I'll root for the A's. But you're an A's fan. I'm a Giants fan. So let's let's talk a little Bay Area baseball and and kind of give our thoughts on what we think they're going to do this year. And then I think after that, we can we we got through a lot <laughs> today. <laughs> so I think we'll kind of wrap up the episode soon here. But I kind of want to end it talking about our teams. I'll uh, I'll start with you. Uh, we can talk about the A's. I know that you know Marcus Simeon obviously was in the AL MVP voting last year. That guy had an incredible year and. I'm not sure. It, it, I don't know. I don't, I don't think he's going to return. I, there's a lot of teams in that mix right now for him. And so they might lose him. They, they lost Hendricks, who was a beast out of the bullpen. And so, you know, they resigned a couple people. But what, what are your thoughts on the A's moves this offseason? And obviously, like usual, they went into the playoffs with an incredible record and got booted very soon. Uh, are they going to be worse? What, what, what are your thoughts? Uh, just to touch on, to begin with, with Simeon and Hendricks, um, I remember Marcus Simeon being the worst shortstop in the league. Like, <laughs> he was awful. He was, he he had a, a lot of work to do. Um, Ron Washington was a big part of that. Um, if you look on, like, social media, on, like, a lot of, um, when it comes to defensive talk, like, Ron Washington is the is the current day GOAT when it comes to, to making good infielders. He's got good infielders in Ozzy Albies and Danby Swanson over there in Atlanta. He's really putting them to work. But the amount of work Marcus Simeon had had to put in to be able to be a third in AL MVP in 2019, I believe. Um, it's amazing, man. He's he really became that that foundational piece that that the A's needed at the shortstop position. That's such an important position like shortstop. That's why it's gonna be really tough to to, you know, I don't anticipate him signing back. So to see him go is, is going to be really tough because he is such a, a good piece. You're going to get such a grinder from the shortstop position. You might not get those flashy plays. You know, we brought up, we're, we talked about Lindor. He's not Francisco Lindor, but he's definitely going to make those routine plays that you want him to make. And and every every now and then show off the leather with a, you know, a dive up the middle and a, a strong arm. So He's being talked to to being an uh, uh, option for third base at the Dodgers, which is going to be really tough to see if that comes to fruition. Um, the Twins and the Brewers are also in that conversation. Um, the A's have talked to him a little bit, but I don't anticipate him coming back, unfortunately, which is going to be really sad to see him go. Because same with Hendricks, to see him go from being that guy who gave up a home run to Aaron Judge in the first inning of the 2018 wildcard game, to become the closer that he's become to the best reliever, he, best reliever last year in 2020. It's a huge um, loss, man. I, yeah, it's a huge, that's a huge loss. loss. That's in, you know, three years, 54 mil. The A's can't do that. There's no way that the, the A's can pay Hendricks that money and Hendricks talked about it. He said he really wanted to come back um, to Oakland. The thing was that he never really talked to, he never like got into in touch with them. Like there was no talk from the A's to, to Hendricks. They never really offered him anything. And from my perspective, I think they just didn't offer anything to Hendricks or, or even had a contract talks with him because I think what they could give Hendricks would have been almost insulting to, to such a great reliever that he is so it's tough to to see Hendricks go and um, Simeon's agent came out and said that he anticipates Simeon or he thinks that Simeon deserves a hundred mil contract never gonna happen in Oakland so it's gonna be tough it's it's too a closer and and a shortstop is such a such a tough 
position to to fill. So I don't anticipate both of these guys coming back. So it's going to be tough. But I think I think the A's are going to pull through in 2021. They still got a great third baseman who actually have kind of been thrown around the idea of him moving a shortstop. He was a shortstop growing up. Maybe he can fill that. Chapman can fill that position at short. But I don't know, man. But they got great prospects coming up. Anticipate a couple of them debuting in 2021. But the A's always somehow find a way to to from their farm system to be able to fill those roles from from uh, stars that are leaving. You know, good examples: Giambi. Um, who else, man? I'm trying to think. Uh, I'm blanking. Johnny right Damon in there, right? Johnny Damon. Yeah, I'm trying to. I'm thinking about. I watched Moneyball recently. I'm trying yeah. to think to all those guys that they that they missed out on. Giambi, Johnny Damon. They've been able to do a great job filling roles once star players leave. So it's tough to see them go, but I think they'll they'll pull through in 2021. All right, give me a – it's a 162-game season. Give, give me, like, a, a brief record prediction, and where do you think the A's are going to be this year in terms of record? And do they got a playoff spot? I think they, they definitely got a playoff spot in, in lock. I don't see the AL West being more than a two-team race because of kind of the Rangers, the, the Mariners. I, I don't see them doing a whole lot. Um, I actually think – my prediction is that they'll end up in second place again. I think once this whole cheating thing is passed for the Astros, I know like we we got to see in 2020 um, the Astros, you know, kind of just implode on themselves because of such a mental, just so much uh, bash from them on the social media that you could see like Jose Altuve, it really affected him. You could tell on on the field it really affected him, but. Once they got to the playoffs, I think that really motivated them. You know, they almost snuck into the World Series, which was really scary to 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 see. If they got it to the World Series, I think uh, to to see like the most hated team in 2020 almost make it to the World Series is kind of scary. But I think they picked up some confidence from that. So I anticipate the Astros kind of sneaking into into first place again, and I kind of see um, a 95-96 win A's team. Um, even with with their losses, but um, I think they'll be able to 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 win a good amount of games and sneak into a wild card spot. Uh, just because uh, the Astros, I think, really just you know they broke out during the playoffs. They they really got hot when when it was necessary, and I think that'll carry over in, in 2021. 95 to 96 wins. That is a lot. Well, the A's were winning 99, 100 games, ending in second place in, like, 20, 2019, so. That's true. That's true. Yeah, they'll probably get 100 runs and get booted in the first round. That's kind of the it's recipe for tough, success. Man. All right. Um, well, I'll talk about the Giants for a little bit. You can chip in, too. Um, listen, the, I don't know if you remember that Giants-A's series last year where the Giants basically were leading by three or more runs in every single game, and then the A's, I don't know how they fucking won the game. Anyway. It's like Piscotti and Canna in the ninth inning. Yeah, dude, that, I don't even, that was probably as a, that was probably top three in, like, worst games I've ever seen. Like, that actually broke my heart. They did it twice in a row, so, anyway. I thought I was watching a replay. I could not believe it. I don't know, man. Sunday. Um, do you remember Sunday, that game? They just absolutely destroyed them. I don't know if you remember that. I, I did not watch that. I know what you're talking about. Uh, I, I actually do remember. I was hanging out with my girlfriend. I purposely did not watch the game, and I saw it was, I think, 15-2. to two. And so, hey, I'm glad I didn't watch it. But <laughs> anyway, look, the Giants are a team that are going – they're going to grind out runs. They're going to have close games. They're not as talented as most teams in the majors right now. We had our run. We had our dynasty. I have very – I'm keeping – look, I'm a Sacramento Kings fan. I'm very used to having low expectations for my teams. So I'm going to do that with the Giants this year. I'm going to set them pretty low. And if they are better than those expectations, then I'm going to be thankful. But, look, we haven't really done much in the offseason. We have Alex Wood. And we got him from the Dodgers. He, he's a decent veteran out of the rotation that we can hopefully get some production out of. 
Mike Iskremski, I love that dude. I wish he wasn't like in his 30s already. I wish he was like 23. That way we could have him for like 10 more years. But we have a lot of older guys. Uh, Joey Bart might not get much of an opportunity this year. And honestly, I think that's good. He didn't do that good last year. And I hope he's able to kind of grow in that farm system with Posey back in. And as a Giants fan, I, I've had the same mindset for the last four years. I just love watching Posey, Bell, Crawford. I love watch. I love giving that nostalgia from the early 2010s, even if we're not winning games. Um, I don't know. I, I love baseball. Honestly, baseball is probably my – I would say it's my favorite sport to watch with, like, in terms of watching the Giants over any other sport. So I'm going to be watching a lot of games. I don't – we're either going to be really bad or we're going to stick in there when, like – if I had to give a ballpark prediction, I'd probably go like, I don't know, 76 wins. I think we're going to be under 500. I don't think we're going to be the worst team in baseball, but I don't know. I, I hope we can win 80 or so games, stick in that wild card race a little bit. But look, when you have the Dodgers and the Diamondbacks and the Rockies and now the Padres, oh my God, the Padres are loaded, dude. They're so fun to watch. It's rough. We're going to have like a quarter to half of our games against some of those teams. And uh, I don't see us winning a lot of those games. So I don't know. I'm going to go 76 wins on the year, but I'm going to watch almost every game because I love baseball. I definitely feel that, dude. Um, I think what you brought up was that nostalgia of watching Brandon Bell, Crawford, Posey. Um, as much as you love that nostalgia, I think if in order to be able to win games and meaningful games and make it back to the postseason, I think they need to transition. They really need to transition from, you know, like, yeah, you guys helped us win a World Series and thank you, but you need to bring in new players to be able to, to find that new success, to find that next World Series trophy. Um, I think that to begin with, I think Mauricio Dubon should be your corner piece as your foundation as to going into the future and Mike Ostromsky. And I think instead of putting Dubon in center field, you got to give him some time up the middle to learn from, from Crawford. I think putting Dubon in center field is a little, a little silly from my perspective. Um, I don't know, man. I've kind of questioned some of the, the things. Um, I'm blanking on... Uh, the guys' the manager's name. Um, I'm blanking. Gabe Kaplan. I'm. I've questioned a couple, a couple of his decisions in in the past, ever since he was with uh with Philly. But I don't know. It's gonna be interesting to see going forward. Um, you know, I don't anticipate them being the worst team either. I think I think you're in a good ballpark of of range of wins that they're gonna have, especially. Um, I think you said they're not gonna be over 500. I agree with that. Um. It's and you bring up a good point. Like it's tough to be able to compete against the Dodgers and the Padres. Um, it's a stacked NL West. It was a one-team race for a couple of years because of the Dodgers, but now the Padres are sneaky with that 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 starting rotation and the lineup they have already. Padres are going to be fun to watch this year, man. I act I don't really hate the Padres. You know, I I just like them because obviously they're they're in our division, but the Padres are such a young, talented team, dude. They're gonna them and the White Sox, man. They're they're gonna battle, dude. Padres are gonna be electric this year. I don't know how many wins they're gonna get, but yeah. that talent they have, they're gonna have some games where they're blowing teams out. They're gonna have great statistical stats on the offensive end, dude. They're, it's gonna be electric there. I knew I knew the Padres had a great team. And it's being on the West Coast, like I, they talk about about the Padres all the time, right now. So I, I knew the Padres are a fun team to watch. And with having MLB TV, it's so fun to be able to just tune in to Padres games every night. But in in the playoffs, being able to watch the White Sox, who don't get as much coverage, or I didn't hear much about on the West Coast as you know as other parts of the country, the White Sox were a really fun team to watch. Um, Nick, uh, Nick, Tim Anderson, I said Nick Anderson, Tim Anderson, um, Abreu, Luis Robert were just incredible. And I anticipate uh, Nick Magical from Oak Grove High School. Shout out, Nick Magical. Gonna have a good year. Number, number one, a second base prospect this year. Damn. All right. Um, well, we need to wrap this up. We're almost at an hour and a half, but real quickly, I want to get I want to get a couple of predictions out of you. Uh, who who do you think is going to be in the World Series this year? And uh, give me give me 
Hmm. Give me like an MVP pick and a Cy Young pick. I think heading into this year, just from off-season acquisitions, you know, not even from off-season acquisitions. I think my luck for the for this this year for the World Series from the NL side is going to be the Dodgers. Once again, I don't think you could beat that super team, even with the acquisitions that the Padres had. I mean, you saw it in the playoffs. It was a clean sweep, no matter what the Padres threw at them, whether it was a Tatis home run. You know, you're like, oh, that's gone. Bellinger comes in, just steals that. I think that the Dodgers are, are set up to be able to go far. Um, but I don't know. It's also like that, that thing. Once once you get your, your ring, maybe you relax a little bit. But based, if they play the way they did in 2020, I think that the Dodgers are going to be a force to be reckoned with for years to come, especially with Mookie locked up for, for such a long time and Bellinger and, you know, I think from the NL side, it's going to be the Dodgers. From the AL side, man, that's a that's tougher because I don't think you you really anticipated the the Rays really making it that far. Um, I think a sleeper pick is I want to say the White Sox are really fun to watch, and I think they have a great team. It just didn't end up working out with with a with Oakland in the in the wild card round. Um, I don't know. It's such a tough pick to 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 begin with, with without even um, baseball season starting. But I'll I'll stick with that. Let's say let's say White Sox, White Sox Dodgers. All right, I like I like that. I, again, I I I feel like the White Sox and the Padres are going to meet in a World Series eventually within the next five years. I'm not going to pick that, but yeah, look, I'm a Giants fan, but the Dodgers are literally like dude it's insane like they're insane their, their talent their depth i mean they're literally just on paper just miles better than like the next best team in my opinion so yeah i'm gonna have to pick the dodgers if, if out of the nl i hope they lose in the world series that that's that's what i hope for i i think they can get like two I, i'm hoping they get like two rings out of this whole thing and then they just crumble apart and they pull a warriors and everyone just leaves but i'm gonna pick the dodgers out of the nl out of the al i'm gonna go with the yankees just because i think they are due for a world series appearance i i think um i don't know i i, I like you said without the baseball season really starting it's hard to make a pick out of the al especially because i think anyone can really take it but I'm going to go Yankees Dodgers uh, as my pick. I, I'm going to stick with that. At the beginning of every postseason, I say Yankees Dodgers because that's such a classic like World Series matchup. There's been so many Yankees Dodgers in classic World Series games with the Yankees and the Dodgers that I think that it's kind of an obvious pick, but I don't think the Yankees are, are up for, for making a World Series anytime soon, in my personal opinion. I think, I don't know what it is, man. I think ever since, you know, the... George Steinbrenner hasn't been around. I think that it really fell off for them. But yeah, I, I honestly don't know. I think the I think the MLBs do just for like a cliche World Series matchup where it, it's that's true. You know, like in the NFL, you literally got the Bucks and the Chiefs. I mean, it doesn't get any more cliche than that. So uh yeah, I'm gonna go Yankees Dodgers. But ladies and gentlemen, that is going to wrap up all the content for this episode. Um, thank you for watching. Make sure to follow Austino Sports Talk on Instagram at Austino Sports Talk. We are on Twitter at Austino Sports. And please follow that for any updates regarding episodes, episode content, the guests that we're going to have, and interact with the page because I got my own opinions. I'd love to spark some, some hot takes and some some debates with anybody that is interested. Alejandro, especially, thank you for being my first guest. And I hope to have you on the show in the future to talk some baseball. If I do get some knowledge on soccer, maybe we can talk some soccer too, but that's not going to happen for a while. Uh, again, Alejandro, thank you for being on the show and for sharing your, your story and your experience. And I, I appreciate you hopping on and talking with me for almost an hour and a half i did not expect it to be this long but i think the content's great yeah i appreciate it man i appreciate the invitation and follow this guy a lot more content coming heck yeah all right well you guys have a great rest of your day have a good one guys